In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Palm Sunday again, and the beginning of Holy Week. I can't believe where Lent has gone. It seems such a long time when we kick off at Ash Wednesday, and here we are now at Palm Sunday and staring down Easter. I was going through the readings that make up this Palm Sunday readings as laying down by the lectionary, and I find that each gospel has a slightly different flavour to them. Mark's gospel rushes on with lots of exciting storytelling, but Luke's gospel also has a lot of good storytelling, but it's clear that it's written for a Gentile audience. And Mark's gospel's particular flavour is its deep roots within Judaism. And today we have the story of Jesus' demonstration, the entry that led him into Jerusalem from the Gospel of Matthew. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead, go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two two disciples did as Jesus commanded, and they brought the donkey and colt to them, to him, and he threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the centre of the procession, and all the people around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise to God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Galilee. Palm Sunday is typically marked with the Hosannas, the Save Us from the Crowds. In fact, back in the day we used to sing Hosannas and walk around the cemetery singing our heads off. Jesus in Palm Sunday is hailed as being the king and instead of coming on a white horse as you would expect, he comes on a donkey, a beast of burden. It is a show and tell lesson on servanthood. But if we take a look at Luke's gospel, there's a strange thing that happens at the start of Holy Week. No one saw it happening. No one would have noticed it, but to me it holds the key of understanding Jesus' final days. Jesus making his way to Jerusalem for the start of Passover and being hailed with a singing of psalms of palm branches. Palm branches. However, one person is not celebrating. He is not rejoicing. In fact, he is crying. Jesus was crying. And the Gospel of Luke tells us while the crowd shouted, Jesus shed tears. Jesus is only ever recorded of shedding tears one other time, and that was when Lazarus died. Luke records that as the tears streamed down his face, Jesus cried out, If only you know on this of all days the things that make for peace. But nobody had noticed. The celebration still continued. And we do the same thing year in, year out. A day of celebration. We rejoice with crowds. Our hymns and songs changed. But we don't stop to wonder why Luke had recorded that Jesus was weeping. We are so caught up in this joyous occasion before we head into Holy Week. The Lenten study that I'm taking part in this year is called Fight Like Jesus, How Jesus Waged Peace Throughout Holy Week. It's written by a man called Jason Porterfield 
and each study is the days of Holy Week. And we started off with Palm Sunday and then we went to Monday and we're working through now. And it's about how Jesus spent each day confronting the injustice, calling out oppressors and contending for peace. And I'm going to share some of that with you today. I have found this study has the most amazing insults, insights and it starts with Jesus and this expression of profound sorrow as it's recorded in Luke's Gospel. We pretty much know now as we read about Luke's Gospel what Jesus was thinking as he entered Jerusalem on his final days. And another thing about this is it's the passion with which this lament, and I use the word lament because it clearly actually has the depth of Jesus' great sorrow. So taken together at the beginning of this most holy of weeks, Jesus wanted his followers to know how he makes peace. His tears indicate the strength of how much his concern was that this message would come across. So this is a marker for us to look at Holy Week through the interpretive lens of peacemaking. The struggle of Holy Week can be seen as a struggle for peace. With Jesus' sorrow launching a campaign for peace that consumed his final days because each day he would compete for our peace and each day he would correct the misguided methods used and still used to make peace. Jesus' sorrow becomes more real, it becomes more noticeable when we look ahead to the events that unfold and as this week moves on and you actually start to wonder, well, where does peace come into this? The week was incredibly violent. Priests wanting death, the crowds that were cheering today now then start demanding capital punishment, disciples picking up swords and cutting off an ear, politicians ordering executions. And so most surprisingly of all, we have Jesus clearing the temple of animals and traders. And if you take the temple as the first step after Palm Sunday, you can look at it and you can see that this is no random act. In Mark's Gospel, he writes that Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany. That's it. That's what Mark says. And it may seem insignificant, but the simple act of Jesus having done the Palm Sunday procession, he actually went on a reconnaissance, if you like, and what he saw bothered him, but this had already been bothering Jesus. This is one of the first time he saw this. He's in his final days. He was not going to let it go unchallenged. But instead of acting impulsively there and then, he waited until the next day, and he had a plan. When he returned the next day, his contact, conduct was not impetuous. It was not rash. There was no sudden rush of blood to the head that accompanies most acts of violence. And in contrast to what is often portrayed of this event, the same entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, his actions were purposeful, they were deliberate, they were calculated and planned. Gospel accounts of this event were not violent, but neither was Jesus passive. And he explained his action, and this is the learning bit for the disciples and for ourselves, when he says, it is not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den for robbers. When the money lenders and the animal traders were sent out, the temple, temple's commercial operations ceased. And that allowed the marginalised, the excluded, those who are blind and lame, to actually enter the temple. They came in and were healed. This must have seemed like a miracle for Jesus. 
There was no violence. It was just peaceful. So by refusing to act violently, for Jesus was never a refusal to act. He did not sit idly by and do nothing. And he doesn't tell us to be doormats either. It was love that compelled him to act. Love that moved him to resist injustice, to resist evil with every fibre of his being. Jesus intends for the same act of love to be found in all who follow him. Luke recalls that Jesus go on, goes on to say, if only you knew how I make peace, if only you'd embrace my approach to peacemaking. We see that in our own recent history, really. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, our own Matariki story, there are plenty that we can choose from where there was no violence and where people were acting out of love. Jesus, you'd wonder why Jesus had this absolute cocoon of love in him apart from being God's only son, but Jesus, Jesus was raised by Jewish parents and he would develop his understanding of peace from Hebrew scriptures which is our equivalent of the Old Testament. And he would have learned the beautiful expression of shalom, the Hebrew word for peace. Shalom exists when all our relationships are flourishing, our relationship with God, with each other, with creation and with ourselves. It leaves no part of life untouched, but it cannot exist, coexist with injustice. It's the kind of peace that Jesus sought to bring about during Holy Week. With the events of Holy Week, principles like be mercy, love one another, love your enemies, just become too hard to aspire to. But Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, then be ready for a drastic change in your attitude. Before you were like this, but you're going to be like that. You have to be totally new people. To follow Christ is to be totally transformed. Matt, Mas Matt Maslin is a preacher that I've discovered recently, and I was listening to him talking about, his, about the vision of peace that we have in the Western Church. It is a peace that focus on, focuses on inner tranquility today. It is so easy to slip into the search for that inner peace and the things that fill our soul and our own encounter with God. But we lose, and that is good, we need that too, but we cannot lose the kind of peace that Jesus really came to bring. In scripture, whenever somebody had an encounter with God, it propelled them out into the world to bring that good news to others. Inner peace is important because we have anxiety and we live in a very turbulent society. But the peace that Jesus talks about goes even further. It is a peace that reaches into the social and political arenas where there should be no structural violence and it would promote well-being for everyone, no one excluded. It is a peace that cannot be done in isolation. It is not the nice love of Jesus. It is the radical love of Jesus. Matt calls this defiant peace. Not the warm fuzzies of a tranquil life focused just on ourselves and how we feel. It is a love that disrupts. It moves us out of our bubble of self-isolation from others. It is a love that forgives. It is a love that transforms it is a love that calls us out to others. Peacemaking, not peacekeeping. And Matt calls this kingdom peace. Martin Luther King said in a speech that it was called obnoxious peace. Martin Luther King said, peace is not merely the absence of some negative force, war, tension, confusion, it is the presence of some positive force, justice, love, goodwill, 
and the power of the kingdom of God in our community, in our city, in our country, and in our world, where is the peace? Where is the love? If there is no love in our hearts, there can be no room for peace in our hearts. Throughout history, we have seen where people have thought they had peace. Neville Chamberlain thought he had it in 1938 when he called it peace in our time. The Beatles wrote some songs about it. For you young people, ask your grandmas <laughs> about um, give peace a chance <laughs> and imagine, which was about peace. And even Bob Dylan recorded a fabulous song, which I remember very well, called Blowing in the Wind. <laughs> we all sang that in the 60s. That be as it may, but do we really think that Jesus can't mean what he says when he is calling us to love one another and to love our enemies? Does he mean us really to aspire to that love? Does he mean us just to aspire to peace? Or do we just realise how hard this is and we lean on God's grace as Jesus can't really mean us to love our enemies? And when we see injustice, do we just leave it for others to deal with? To be a follower of Jesus is to love unconditionally. It is to seek peace and justice wherever there is none. It isn't easy. It absolutely is not easy. It is hard. And Paul writes in Galatians, for the whole law to be fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And it is as simple and as difficult as that. Sometimes I go to the message to see what Eugene Patterson has to say, and I think he sums up this message really well when he says, in a word, what I'm saying is, grow up, your kingdom subjects. Now live it like it is. Live out your God-given identity. Live generously and graciously towards others, the way that God lives and loves towards you. Jesus knows us all too well. He understands our failings, but he also knows how God's love can transform our lives. He knows how forgiveness happens, how broken relationships are restored and made whole as the Holy Spirit moves among us. Justice and peace are restored when we love our neighbours, no matter who they are. Let us pray. God, as we listen to the words of Jesus, not as law-giving, but a message of peace, peace for each of us, free us from the limits that we have set upon ourselves and imagine others wrongly. I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and that our attitudes and actions may change as we grow in the love and peace that Jesus gives. Amen.